Liftoff time is set for 9.18 a.m. Eastern. The forecasters say there is a 40% chance that high winds and rain will force a delay. The first shuttle mission of the year will feature the first U.S. spacewalk in more than five years. Well, Atlantis has been working and flying together for nearly two years to prepare for this mission. Many of the hours have been spent underwater to simulate the near-zero gravity environment of space. Atlantis Commander Air Force Colonel Stephen Nagel flies gliders as a hobby. This will be his third trip to space, but his first since 1985. It's been a real good group to work with. We're very compatible. We had a real good time training with this crew. We've had some additional time to be together since the flight slipped about a year from its original targeted launch date. But it's uh, all been fun time for us and good productive time. Shuttle pilot Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel Kenneth Cameron will be making his first space flight, although he has spent plenty of time talking to other astronauts. Okay, Franklin, yeah, we're getting some good shots of the lightning. And, uh, Cameron has served as capsule communicator at the Johnson Space Center in Houston for five previous flights. During the Atlantis mission, he will also be communicating. He will be using the shuttle's ham radio to speak to high school students on the ground. We'll be making contacts with uh, students in, in their schools during the course of the mission. And we have to fit that in with the, what will be a very busy timeline, but we hope to make contact uh, with about nine or ten different schools if that uh, all works out. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Jerry Ross is a mission specialist aboard Atlantis. His specialty, however, is performed outside the orbiter. Ross will perform the first American spacewalk since he last did it in 1985 to test construction materials for the proposed space station. This time, he will be testing several devices in the cargo bay that may be used on the space station to assist movement in space. We have uh, literally taken this from conception all the way through to flight hardware and very much looking forward to the having the opportunity to, to go outside and conduct the flight test experiment with the hardware that we will have on board. Assisting Ross during the six-hour spacewalk will be mission specialist Jay App. He is making his first flight into space. He will also be responsible for deploying the 17-ton Gamma Ray Observatory on the third day of the mission. Finally, there's mission specialist Linda Godwin. She's also making her first space flight. Her responsibilities during the mission include operating the shuttle's robot arm to deploy the Gamma Ray Observatory, and later hoisting the spacewalking astronauts at the end of the arm to test their maneuverability. Godwin is single. When she arrived this week at the Kennedy Space Center, the other astronauts had their spouses waiting for them. But as a prank, they passed by their husbands and hugged Godwin instead. The crew of Atlantis has been waiting a long time for this mission. It appears they are relaxed and ready to mix having a good time with five days of hard work at the office, an office that travels at more than 17,000 miles an hour. Tom Intier, CNN reporting. In Pacific. Question. Clouds to clear in less than one hour if the schedule goes according to plan. They will be lifting off from the Kennedy Space Center on the beginning of a one-week journey to space. CNN, of course, will have live coverage. Uh, scheduled liftoff 9, 18 a.m. Good morning, Donna. All conditions are go except for one, and that is Mother Nature. The cloud cover at the Kennedy Space Center right now is a no-go situation. At the landing site, if they need to use it, it is also no-go. It is below 8,000 feet scattered, and that is a problem and the only problem they are working right now. The orbiter is fueled and ready. The astronauts have been inside for several hours, and the clock is running on the time they can spend on their back. They were awakened about 4.30 this morning and got up and had their traditional breakfast of steak and eggs. Uh, a few moments later, they went inside, suited up in their pressurized suits, and uh, then they made their way out to the launch pad. So they are now waiting and watching out the window, looking at the cloud cover that is uh, causing them such concern right now. NASA officials say that they are at T minus nine and probably going to stay there for a while until the weather situation improves. CNN's John Zarella joins us now from the Kennedy Space Center with an update on the weather situation. John? Tom, they are in that nine-minute hold right now, and as you mentioned, they will likely stay in that hold because the ceiling is low, uh, below the 8,000-foot uh, mark. All the other weather conditions are go. What we're going to end up happening is going to end up happening here is they will just sit and wait, and as soon as it clears, the, uh, the last of the green lights will come on, and uh, then they'll start the, the countdown. Uh, if they were to pick up the countdown, it would happen in the next uh, few minutes or so, but as you mentioned, that's not likely to happen right away. Uh, once they do get into space, it's going to be an interesting and fairly busy five-day mission for the astronauts. Uh, the first uh, big event will be the deployment of the Gamma Ray Observatory, affectionately known as GRO. It's uh, one of NASA's four great observatories, the second to be launched into orbit. The first was the Hubble Space Telescope. 
the Gamma Ray Observatory, NASA scientists uh, say, uh, should provide them with many secrets to the cataclysmic explosions that led to the creation of the universe. That's uh, what gamma rays are all about. The uh, other big event is the EVA. Two of the astronauts will don their spacesuits and to walk out in the cargo bay where they will be practicing some techniques that will be needed around the turn of the century in order to uh, keep the space station uh, maintained once the U.S. space station is in orbit. They'll be using a cart inside the cargo bay, moving it along to see in different methods uh, to see what's going to be the easiest and best way for them to walk around and do some maintenance uh, in space. The uh, live picture now of the, uh, the shuttle, the shuttle Atlantis sitting on the pad, the clouds uh, behind the shuttle now, uh, those are not the primary concern. The primary concern are, as Tom and Tier mentioned, the, uh, the cloud cover at the landing strip in case they should have to make an emergency return here. The astronauts need to be able to see that strip before they can come back. So right now, again, in the T-minus nine-minute hold, Tom, and uh, as usual, the weather is, uh, is biting NASA again this morning. Tom? The weather usually is the problem. John, maybe we should clarify for our viewers a little bit that it isn't just the return to the landing site that they're concerned about that 8,000-foot ceiling. They need to see the orbiter all the way up. That's exactly right. They want to be able to keep uh, the cameras on it in case there are any problems. And uh, with the kind of cloud cover they have right now, it would be difficult uh, to follow the orbiter up uh, through its ascent. So both of those conditions are critical to, uh, to lift off. All right, John, thank you very much. Chief Astronaut Dan Brandenstein is uh, flying the shuttle training aircraft uh, around the area, checking on the cloud cover. They have been releasing weather balloons uh, throughout the morning and are monitoring the situation on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. In uh, about uh, 15 minutes, uh, we are scheduled for the opening of the window for launch. It doesn't appear now that it will occur on time. But CNN will have live coverage of the launch of Atlantis uh, beginning around 9.15 if it does occur on time. But again, as I said, it stands right now that it's going to be delayed for a while. We'll continue to stay on top of the situation. They're in the process of uh, making a decision whether to change from runway 15, which they normally use to runway 33. Uh, they have given the clearance. They are in the process of repolling everyone. But as of right now, the weather is in the acceptable range for the launch this morning. Uh, they will be making a decision to start the clock sometime in the next two or three minutes. Bob? you do is count it down to five minutes and then get a last look at the runway landing facility on 3-3 get a determination of what the visibility is so once they reach five minutes they will hold temporarily and then take a last look at the possibility of returning to the launch site that they need to have at least 8,000 feet of clearance and they are going to stop at five minutes and then look at the weather and possibly even go on at that point so we're very very close to the possibility of a launch of Atlantis this morning. Donna? Uh, they are making the final preparations, uh, uh, trying to take uh, advantage of this opening. In a moment, the crew will be instructed to close their visors. Memories cleared, no unexpected errors. OTC to flight crew, close and lock your visors, initiate O2 flow, and enjoy the ride. CDR, Roger, thanks a million. Okay, let's go for ET, LH2, pressurization. Throughout the morning, they have been watching the skies. The uh, ceiling at 8,000 feet has been a problem, and uh, the weather has been a major concern. Uh, no problems with the orbiter. But the weather, uh, they had uh, showers in the area earlier and uh, thick cloud cover. And then at the uh, landing site, they had a problem uh, with uh, the ceiling. It was below 8,000, so they simply and switched runways the after uh, taking the shuttle the landing the aircraft, uh, the training aircraft, through a potential scenario of a return to launch site. Uh, they found that uh, the visibility was good enough, so they uh, reconfigured their computers and are now uh, counting down uh, the last final seconds. Uh, the visors are closed on the five astronauts aboard it, and, and let's listen in now as the uh, count continues. T minus one minute. Ground launch sequencer verifying main engines are ready. Residual hydrogen burn igniters are armed. T minus 45 seconds. Sound suppression water system armed. That will release water at T minus 16 seconds at the rate of 900,000 gallons a minute. T minus 31 seconds. We have the handoff to Atlantis's onboard computers. Atlantis now controlling. 25. 
morning. T minus 16 seconds, sound suppression water system operating. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, one engine start, three good engines up and burning, two, one, zero, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Atlantis and the Gamma Ray Observatory, seeking out the explosive forces of the universe. Hello, program, Houston. Roger, roll, Atlantis. Houston now controlling. Roll maneuver complete. Placing Atlantis and crew in the heads-down attitude and on course for its 828.5-degree inclination orbit. Engine throttling down now to help maintain uh, optimum aerodynamic conditions as Atlantis accelerates through the dense lower atmosphere. Engine throttling further down now to 67%. Velocity 860 feet per second, all systems performing well. Atlantis now beginning to emerge from the uh, region of maximum dynamic pressure. Engines are throttling up. Atlantis Houston, go at throttle up. Atlantis has three main engines burning at 104% rated thrust. Velocity 2,200 feet per second, altitude 67,000 feet, downrange distance 8 nautical miles. All systems performing well. The next uh, milestone in this uh, climb to orbit will be uh, solid rocket booster burnout and staging. That coming up in just about 15 seconds. Confirmation of a clean separation on time. Guidance has converged. Uh, velocity now 42. As you can see, the solid rocket boosters uh, finished their work and are now uh, falling back into the earth. Will be recovered, and uh, it looked uh, like a beautiful liftoff. Uh, as you can see, it went through the clouds very quickly, and uh, the long-range tracking cameras, however, are still uh, providing a, a pretty good picture of Atlantis. That is, as it uh, continues to burn off its three main engines, there is the uh, launch pad area uh, where Atlantis was just a couple of moments ago. So uh, Atlantis is on its way to orbit, the beginning of a five-day mission to deploy the Gamma Ray Observatory, and we should also have a spacewalk uh, coming up in the first part of the week. It uh, is going, promises to be a mission high on drama. The uh, Gamma Ray Observatory is the heaviest non-military cargo that has ever been put into space. So Atlantis is on its way, and it appears uh, they are headed safely to orbit. They have passed the solid rocket booster separation, which is uh, what everyone looks to as far as uh, safety. Once the uh, solid rockets are off, uh, it is a little easier to return back either to the launch site or the transatlantic abort site. So the beginning of the mission is uh, underway, and we, of course, will continue to have live coverage throughout this mission with the Gamma Ray Observatory and a six-hour spacewalk by two astronauts. We want to uh, take you back just a few moments now and take a look at the last few seconds of the launch, uh, a launch that uh, was delayed a few moments by the weather concerns, but the clouds opened and they fired the engines. Three good engines up and burning, two, one, zero, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Atlantis and the Gamma Ray Observatory, seeking out the explosive forces of the universe. Roger, roll, Atlantis. Houston now controlling. Roll maneuver complete. Placing Atlantis and crew in the heads down attitude and on course for its 828 and a half. Countdown to launch had been one of the smoothest in the 10 year history of the shuttle program. No drama. Uh, we had a safe and successful launch, and uh, we're looking forward to, to this mission and, and the next one, which we hope is only a few weeks away. 
Now in orbit, the astronaut crew is preparing for a busy five-day mission. Sunday, the 17-ton Gamma Ray Observatory will be released from the shuttle's cargo bay. The observatory is expected to answer many questions about the origins of the universe as it gathers data on exploding stars, black holes, and quasars. Monday, astronauts Jay Apt and Jerry Ross will take the first U.S. space walk in five and a half years. The three-hour jaunt around the cargo bay will test methods for maintaining the space station once it's in orbit around the turn of the century. The shuttle, NASA officials say, is now beginning to prove itself. We have produced a vehicle that is, is really world-class. Since the Challenger accident, this, this flight that's airborne is the 14th flight we've flown. Flights 15 and 16 are coming up soon. Discovery is set for launch later this month and Columbia in late May. John Zarella, CNN, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Seen in nearly six years, the astronauts inside the orbiter preparing for a spacewalk. This is a live picture from Atlantis right now, and you see Jerry Ross and Jay App. Jay App there uh, holding the camera, preparing uh, what they call pre-breathing. Uh, what they are doing, they are breathing a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen, uh, and they have taken the pressure of the crew cabin down to prepare themselves uh, for a spacewalk, which will occur on Monday. And uh, this spacewalk uh, will last six uh, and a half hours. Jerry Ross is the last one outside in the crew cabin. He uh, closed the latch uh, in 1985 and now will reopen it in 1991 and uh, will go outside and spend six and a half hours with Jay Apt uh, doing some construction techniques for the uh, spacewalk and for the space station later on. Most of the day will be spent, however, today checking out the Gamma Ray Observatory. What they are going to do is check out all of the electrical connections and the communications hardware while it is in the cargo bay. It will be released from Atlanta at uh, early tomorrow afternoon, but uh, not before it goes a full checkout to make sure it will operate well. Later this morning, they're going to be using a ham radio operator. Uh, pilot Ken Cameron is uh, also known as KB5AWP. He is a ham radio operator. As a matter of fact, all of the astronauts are ham radio operators, but he will be uh, contacting some children today, uh, probably in about uh, two or three hours from now, and he will be uh, talking. Most of the morning has been spent, however, taking a look outside the window as they orbit the Earth. Jay Apt was uh, taking some photographs as they traveled over the Sahara Desert and said it was a very impressive sight. Marsha, that uh, pass was over uh, Africa. We just had some superb weather. It was uh, just terrific to see all that uh, color in the desert. And then we just coasted out. Uh, we uh, saw Mauritania, we got a bunch of Linhoff that was through the first of our Linhoff, uh, three of the Linhoff bags. And Mike Helmer's going to be real happy with us. Uh, we're just coping back and we're getting some really great weather. And as if by magic, J.F. now has a helmet on. Uh, for the past couple of hours, uh, they have been uh, working inside the crew cabin. Uh, in the last hour, they have had these uh, helmets on doing the pre-breathing exercises. You can see him there with his Hasselblad camera. And the pictures they bring back uh, are spectacular. And uh, there will be a lot of pictures. They've had a lot of time uh, to take pictures this morning and will continue to. Ralph, here is where the shuttle is. It is coming over the west coast of the United States. What they're going to be doing for the next hour and 35 minutes is pre-breathing uh, pure oxygen to remove the nitrogen from their blood to uh, prevent the possibility of bends while out in space. They're also at the same time sending up commands trying to get the antenna, the high gain antenna on the Gamma Ray Observatory to unlatch. If they are not able to do that, they will go ahead and open the door and the two astronauts, Jerry Ross and Jay Apt, will conduct an emergency spacewalk, go out the end of the robot arm and see if they can find out, simply find out what is wrong with the antenna to keep it from deploying. They probably will not uh, complete that spacewalk until later this afternoon. We, of course, will have live coverage. Molly? Thanks. They're only able to spend so many hours in the pressurized suits, and it uh, will be determined later today how much of a problem it will be. But Jerry Ross and Jay Apt are now donning their equipment down on the mid-deck of Atlantis. It is the first time since December 1st, 1985, that an American has walked in space, and the last time it happened, it was Jerry Ross. He is the last one to close the latch door on the cargo bay, and he will be the first one to open it again. Dave? Thank you, Tom. You are some observatory and now as you said there are some problems some high drama developing 
as you can see in these take pictures uh, just a few minutes ago from Atlantis. Astronauts Jerry Ross and Jay App are suited up. That is Ken Cameron there, another one of the astronauts who is helping them with their suits. They are preparing for a spacewalk. They are pre-breathing right now in order to purge their bodies of nitrogen, which of course could cause them the bends if they did not do this. So uh, in about 40 minutes or so, they are expected to be leaving the airlock there. They are now inside the airlock. They will be leaving that airlock and heading into the cargo bay with the MMUs, the manned maneuvering units. There you can see the Gamma Ray Observatory on the end of the robotic arm, still connected. Its uh, solar panels are deployed. There are no problems there. It was going smoothly. The problem is with a high-gain antenna. The antenna is stuck. It is stuck down. What has happened is there you can see that high-gain antenna. NASA has issued several commands, almost half a dozen, to that high-gain antenna throughout the morning and now into the afternoon. They plan two more commands to send two more commands to it to try a last-ditch attempt to go ahead and free it up. They're not sure what. There was one of those attempts. You could see what they did was they moved the arm to try and get it to free up. Uh, there is a... a the animation you can see here will show exactly what it is supposed to do, and that's what uh, will ultimately uh, have to happen if they are to leave that, uh, that 17 and a half ton spacecraft out there. There's the high gain antenna. It is supposed to pop up like that. That has not happened. It relays data down to Earth and accepts data from Earth, so it is critical. Without it, they are uh, dead in the water with that spacecraft. Again, we uh, have not seen an EVA, an emergency EVA, since 1985. It was August of 1985 when the Ace Repo Company, as they were called, uh, there you have a live picture. We have uh, received the signal back from Atlantis. That is a live picture, again, of the antenna. As I was saying, it was August 1985 when astronauts Van Hoften and Fisher, they called themselves the Ace Repo Company, went after a SINCOM satellite fixed it in space, and then uh, redeployed it. So it has been a while since NASA has done one of these. It should take uh, about an hour, they say, from the, uh, from the time that they actually leave uh, the airlock and get in uh, to, to get out there to the arm and to try and fix that. We will, of course, bring you the live pictures just as soon as uh, we go to this uh, spacewalk. Back to you, Molly. Dave, scientists at the Goddard Space Flight Center and at the Johnson Space Center in Houston are frantically sending commands, emergency commands, to what you are looking at right there, a live picture from space, the high-gain antenna of the Gamma Ray Observatory. It was supposed to be deployed several hours ago. It is stuck. It is not moving. They've tried a half a dozen times. They are in the process right now, again, of trying to get it to free itself. While that is going on, Astronauts Jerry Ross and Jay Apt have suited up and are preparing for a spacewalk in order to attempt again to free up that antenna. Ross and Apt are presently in the airlock. They are completely suited up. They are doing pre-breathing. That pre-breathing that they are doing right now is, of course, to purge oxygen or to purge nitrogen from their system so that uh, they would not experience any effects of the bends. There they are right there. What uh, will happen is that when they go out there, there are no manned maneuvering units on board the shuttle. Those are those little uh, backpacks, those Buck Rogers backpacks that they sometimes use to go motoring around in space. So what NASA will do is they will bring the robot arm, which the Gamma Ray Observatory is now attached to, closer into the shuttle. And the astronauts will somewhat will crawl down that arm. You can see it's going to be extremely dramatic pictures, although NASA says it's fairly routine to do this kind of thing. Uh, routine, except that they haven't done it in about five and a half years. Uh, you can see that the Gamma Ray Observatory, on the end of that arm, the solar panels are arrayed out as they should be, but the antenna is stuck. And they will be crawling down that arm and attempting to go out there and see if they can fix it and get it to deploy. The last time they did this was 1985, when astronauts Van Hoften and Fisher called themselves the Ace Repo Company, brought back a SINCOM satellite and fixed it. Again there you can see the antenna stuck. Live pictures again from, uh, from NASA, from Mission Control. We will of course bring you highlights throughout the afternoon of the spacewalk as soon as it begins and throughout the afternoon for its entire duration. And outside the Space Shuttle Atlantis.
observatory paralyzed by an unresponsive antenna until two scientists snatched success from the jaws of failure through the hatch of the space shuttle Atlantis. CNN's John Zarella reports on a day of very, very high drama. 280 miles above the Earth, the Gamma Ray Observatory floated attached to the end of the shuttle Atlantis's 50-foot robotic arm. All had gone perfectly on this mission until the observatory's high-gain antenna refused to respond to deployment commands. With no success on that last attempt uh, to free the high-gain antenna, the fourth attempt tried so far today. Half a dozen commands were sent to the antenna, no response. NASA even tried using the arm to shake the antenna loose. The antenna is critical for transmitting information to and from the observatory. While all this was going on, astronauts Jerry Ross and Jay Apt entered the airlock, donned their spacesuits, and prepared for a possible space walk. It wasn't long before the word was given. You have a go-to-maneuver to the EVA attitude. Within minutes, the hatch opened, and Ross and Apt entered the shuttle's cargo bay. Nineteen and a half minutes later, Ross shook the antenna boom and freed it. It's free. It's free. I can see it move. It's free. It was almost too easy. But the two astronauts were not quite finished. A series of bolt twists were required to finally get the antenna to swing into its required position. Having quickly accomplished the antenna fix, NASA decided to let the astronauts spend more time in the cargo bay running through various experiments. After three and a half hours, the Jay and Jerry show ended. The Gamma Ray Observatory was finally released from the end of the robotic arm. Jay and Jerry, you did a fantastic job. It's time to come in and, uh, as Jerry said before, wash up for dinner. The day's events were a major victory for the shuttle program, evidence that the vehicle and the astronauts can do what NASA has been boasting all along. John Zarella, CNN, reporting. Jerry Ross and Jay Apt had to take a walk on the wild side, 280 miles above Earth. The high drama got underway Sunday when a critical antenna of the $617 million Gamma Ray Observatory jammed. Ross was overjoyed when the unscheduled jaunt to shake it loose ended in success. It's free. It's free. I can see it move. It's free. I can see it move. Okay, uh, Chef, I propose that we go to nominal deploy from here. Uh, stand by one, Jerry, while we get a little concurrence in the room. It's going to take a minute. Uh, it's sprung out about five feet. Fantastic. Yeah. Good work. Where's the garbage from? I was just on this one uh, FSS pin and just kind of shook on the side of the building. Good plan. Okay, Jerry, I want you to uh, pick up with a nominal procedure. Good job. Fantastic. A spacewalk that was already on the schedule is still set for Monday. Coming up, we're required to take an emergency walk in space. The problem came when an antenna on a 17 and a half ton satellite they were deploying got stuck. So two astronauts went outside, shook the antenna, and that's what did it. With a little more tinkering, the satellite floated freely into space, just as it was supposed to. It's not immediately clear what caused the problem. Cart, they pulled themselves along the track. You could go for error this way. What a great view. Isn't that fantastic? Okay. Breaking. The techniques for moving about and working in space will be essential for astronauts when the space station is constructed around the turn of the century. It's what we're trying to evaluate, and then we'll incorporate that uh, design into the space station design. The two astronauts also used mechanical and electric carts. Turning the handles on the electric cart produces 24 volts of electricity, propelling the cart down the track at six feet per second. With the cargo bay open to the earth, the astronauts found time for some sightseeing. Perhaps the most spectacular event was saved for last 
astronaut aft, attached by foot restraints, was moved around on the end of the shuttle's 50-foot remote arm. Here, NASA was testing, keeping the arm stable, while an astronaut works, perhaps on a satellite, or performs maintenance on the outside of the space station. Space this morning. High winds Wednesday delayed the shuttle's return. CNN's John Zarella has this mission wrap-up. The nine, countdown and launch eight, of the shuttle Atlantis with its five-member crew five, was one of the smoothest in the 10-year history of the shuttle program. Two, one, zero, and liftoff of the space shuttle Atlantis and the Gamma Ray Observatory. The target date was April 4th. Launch date ended up the 5th. Liftoff was a mere four minutes later than planned. No drama. Uh, we had a safe and successful launch, and uh, we're looking forward to, to this mission. The mission provided an early thrill for people living on the Hawaiian Islands. The shuttle's giant external fuel tank could be seen breaking up as it streaked back to Earth in the pre-dawn hours Friday. Once in orbit, as part of a ham radio experiment, students got to ask questions of the astronauts. Do you tend to re-evaluate your life when you look at the Earth? Over. Uh, when you float up here above uh, the Earth in our little spacecraft and look down at the great big spacecraft that we all fly on, it makes us all think about uh, what our priorities are. Over. One priority was the Sunday deployment of the Gamma Ray Observatory. The 17-ton spacecraft is expected to answer many questions about the origins of the universe but a smooth deployment was not to be. You have a go-to maneuver to the EVA attitude. In what became known as the Jay and Jerry Show, astronauts Jay Apt and Jerry Ross left the protected confines of Atlantis to fix a stuck antenna on the observatory. It's free. It's free. I can see it move. It's free. I can see it move. In less than 20 minutes, Ross reached the antenna and shook it loose. The two astronauts then spent another three and a half hours practicing different methods for moving themselves and equipment around in space, essential for astronauts when the space station is built. Those experiments continued Monday. This guy can really travel. He could move hundreds and hundreds of feet this way without getting tired. You could go forever this way. Great deal. As they pulled themselves along on a 46-foot track constructed in the cargo bay. Tuesday was restful, providing time for gazing at the Earth and packing for the return trip home. But Wednesday's miserable weather at the Edwards Air Force Base landing site and the Kennedy Space Center kept Atlantis in orbit an extra day. By Thursday morning, NASA had its pick of landing sites, choosing the dry lake bed in California over the concrete runway in Florida. John Zarella, CNN, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Bill Humdinger. Re-entry came a day late because of dangerous crosswinds yesterday. Touchdown. Left behind in orbit, the Gamma Ray Observatory, which will probe mysteries of deep space. Here, Today's touchdown. landing was a day short of the 10th anniversary of the first shuttle mission by Columbia. The next launch, Discovery, scheduled for April 23rd. The Brunswick Glencoe Airport. And it started going back up. It looked like it was fixing to pull out. And then it just turned and comes straight back down. I heard the explosion and seen the fire and the smoke and, and parked my car and, and uh, put my jacket on, ran up through the woods to see what I could do. We got about 50 feet in front of the plane. And there was uh, just a big pile of metal rubble and, and everything was burning. Everything was around was on fire, so it was so hot I couldn't. The heat was unbearable. Investigators say the weather was perfect when the plane went down. It crashed about a mile and a half from here in a thick wooded area. Emergency crews had to use a bulldozer to clear out trees to try and reach the victims. Tower's 35-year-old daughter Marion was among the 23 victims, as was NASA astronaut Sonny Carter. We don't know what happened. You know, apparently, apparently the plane came in pretty hard. Uh, the fire department had a problem getting out some magnesium fires. Local authorities are waiting for federal investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board, but their efforts will be hampered. There was no flight recorder aboard. None was required. Sean Caleb, CNN, Brunswick, Georgia. Plane crash in southern Georgia. Carter's space shuttle flight came aboard the Discovery in November 1989. He and his crew members orbited the Earth 79 times. Before he joined the space program, Carter was a medical doctor, a Navy pilot, and a professional soccer player. Carter is survived by his wife and two teenage daughters. Sonny Carter was 43. Ralph? Sonny's. Um, I think we're very fortunate indeed.
Carter was a former professional soccer player. The gifted athlete was also a Navy flight surgeon. He leaves behind a wife and two daughters.